Thank you. I'm glad to be back in Washington, D.C. As Father mentioned, I uh, did my theological studies in this wonderful town. I try never to stay too long when I'm here because I'm afraid uh, you can get something you can't get rid of. Uh, power does tend to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, and this city shows that in many ways. And yet I'm still happy to be back here, and especially here at the Catholic Information Center, which is a, a hub of all kinds of good things, and it's an honor to be here. I am going to speak to you in a way perhaps a lot of uh, people in Washington, D.C. don't speak, uh, speak in moral terms. You can ask me about policy issues, and if I happen to have read about it or thought about it, I'll be happy to offer you a, an answer. But what I'm trying to do in defending the free market is precisely what the subtitle says, to offer a moral case for the free economy. And in order to uh, offer a moral case for the free economy, I need to tell it to you through the lens of my own experience. And this is what I, I tend to do in the book, is I go back and forth from anecdotes and stories and things that impressed me and lessons that I learned. And uh, the first thing most of my new acquaintances get to know about me, even if you can't recognize it in my accent, is that I was born in Brooklyn, New York. And that's a, very much an indelible part of my own consciousness because it was such a vivid place to grow up on Coney Island Avenue in Brooklyn and um, uh, see the world from a whole different angle. In fact, to see the world from many, many different angles because the people you were in association with came from all over the world. Uh, the smells and sounds and accents uh, that one heard as I was growing up were, were impressionable and mind-expanding. If you walked out my front door on a little little apartment that was probably half the size of this, this room, uh, you were thrown into a multi-ethnic experiment before that phrase uh, ever came into fashion. Uh, I'd go across the street to my friend who was Chinese, and stereotypically enough, his family ran a Chinese laundry. I could go to the corner. And on the one corner, there was a kosher pizza parlor. I don't even know if you have a kosher pizza parlor here in Washington, D.C. Uh, or the Polish plumber down the street who kept our pipes flowing. And, uh, but, and it was the longest time I didn't realize that I wasn't uh, Jewish growing up in the heavily Jewish. I knew that there was something different about us because our kitchen smelled differently. Uh, but I can still keep a kosher kitchen if I, if I had to. And uh, when we grew up in this little apartment, my brothers had a kind of a little closet of a bedroom uh, with bunk beds. And my parents had a bedroom that overlooked Coney Island Avenue. This was nowhere near the beach, by the way. Uh, this was like three miles from the beach. And uh, this was before the invention of privacy. So there was no door on my parents' bedroom. Uh, and I had a crib and then later a... Uh, cot in that room. My sister slept on the couch, and we had this little living room, and then this tiny kitchen. And the kitchen looked directly into an identical apartment across this air chute. It wasn't, think honeymooners, right? This is kind of the atmosphere of the place, so you can hear people. And, and this apartment, in this apartment lived, and I tell this story in the book, Mr. and Mrs. Schneider, and I've kind of confused all of the names because I don't know what relatives still exist and uh, all of that. But there was this, this real couple, Mr. and Mrs. Schneider, uh, and I was watching her one day from my apartment window, from the uh, windowsill, and I was looking over the windowsill. It was a short windowsill. I was about five years old. I couldn't have been much over five years old because we moved from that apartment when I was about five. And Mrs. Schneider, it was a spring day. She was wearing a beautiful... Uh, flowered dress, short sleeve, and she was rolling some dough. And uh, I was watching her roll the dough, and she'd then take some of the uh, mixture that she had made, walnuts and raisins and brown sugar and uh, all of this, and put it onto a piece of the, the dough and then roll it into a little crescent and then put that on a cookie sheet. And she'd be doing this and then slip it into a green Wedgwood oven. She'd leave that, and she'd go back to making more of these. These are called rugula, by the way. It's a Eastern European pastry. It's magnificent. And I'm watching this, these 
undulating movements and becoming more and more mesmerized by Mrs. Schneider, and then, of course, wafting across from her kitchen window to our kitchen window is the aroma of these goodies being baked. Now, Mrs. Schneider didn't look at me once during this whole period of time as I watched her until she pulled out the last tray of rugula. She placed it down on the windowsill, and then she looked up at me, and she said, you'll come, I'll give you to eat. And so I got up over the windowsill and ran across to her and uh, held out my greedy little hands, and she put a napkin on my hands and began to place the warm rugula into the napkin. And it was at that moment that I saw, running up her forearm, a series of blue tattooed numbers. I had no clue what that meant at that time. And frankly, I was more interested in the rugula. I went back into my apartment, thanked her, went back into my apartment, and the first thing I did was to hide my cookies from my siblings <laughs> because the Sirico's raised no dumb children. And uh, my mom came in, a hardworking woman. My, my mom and dad were very hardworking people. We were poor. I didn't know we were poor. That, that wasn't a class consciousness thing in those days in the 1950s. But uh, my mom came in. I said, Mrs. Schneider gave me some things to eat. And she said, good, good. And I said, but why does Mrs. Schneider have tattoos on her arm? She has numbers on her arm. And that was my first lesson in moral philosophy. That's why I say that uh, those formative years were really formative because embedded deep into who I am, deep into my consciousness, was this moral lesson. And here's how my mother, who never graduated from high school, never finished sixth grade, I don't think, here's how she told it to me. She said, you know when you watch the westerns on television on Saturday morning? And I said, yeah. And she said, you know when the cowboys lasso the calves? And I said, yeah. She said, now, what do they do after they tie the calf? I said, well, they, they stamp it with uh, brand. She said, yeah, and why do they do that? I said, well, then this way everybody knows whose calf that is. She said, that's what people did to Mr. and Mrs. Schneider. And that's what they did to the whole family. And that's why you always have to be especially nice to Mr. Schneider, because we knew he was a little off. I thought it was an Italian word. They said mashugana. <laughs> it's a Yiddish word for crazy. I, and she said, you have to be very good to them and very nice to them, because they had a hard time. They're refugees. Now, this was another lesson, because I'd always heard the term refugee used in the, sense, in the sentence that said, uh, there are more Poles who have moved into the neighborhood, more Chinese who have moved into the neighborhood, more Puerto Ricans moved into the neighborhood, more refugees moved into the neighborhood. And I always thought refugees was another nationality. <laughs> they came from refuge. But no, they came to refuge. And that also caused me to think of this is the place where we live, where people come for safety. And this became a kind of lens through which I saw all of the different things that were happening uh, as I was growing up, whether it was the images from the South of kids being uh, hit and had dogs sicked on them because they wanted to eat at a Woolworths. We had a Woolworths in the neighborhood. Or whether I heard about what was going on in Cuba or in Red China and all of these things, I was reading them through and understanding them through this lens of what was it? At the time, I couldn't have told you it. It was anthropology. It was a certain assumed anthropology about who human beings are and how they ought to be treated, a sense of justice, a sense of rightness, a sense of morality, without any of those words that were used. It wasn't a formal uh, academic exercise. It was a personal understanding of human dignity. And as I grew up, and uh, I'll leave out a lot of the gory details, but I'll, I'll tell you that I left uh, my, um, my faith at about 13 years old, didn't come back to my faith until I was uh, about 26 or 27 years old. So about 13 years, 
I was away, and I wandered. 